Um, and I'm so grateful to my former uh, mentors for all of their support in the past. So just as I was getting ready to launch a research uh, in career independently, life sometimes has a different plan. Um, and sometimes your life can take a detour. So for a, a number of years, I became a full-time parent and then also a high school science teacher. And here I am with my students, um, taking them to a microbiology exhibit. I would often take them on field trips to share my passion for microbiology at, at local universities. And every time I stepped back and foot in the lab, uh, my heart would flutter, I would get butterflies, and I realized I could not ignore that feeling. So I have reclaimed my identity as a research scientist. I'm now an aspiring independent investigator. And my research focus is stress-induced adaptations in the human fungal pathogen Cryptococcus. I'm currently a postdoctoral fellow at Duke University, and um, I have the pleasure of being a fellow with the Tri-Institutional Molecular Mycology and Pathogenesis Training Program. And this is a tremendous fellowship, a tremendous amount of support. If anyone was interested in this, definitely email me and I can tell you more about the fellowship. But it has provided me with a number of outstanding mentors, including my primary mentor, um, who studies genome instability in budding yeast, as well as uh, Joe Heitman, Tom Peters, and Andrew Alspaugh. They've all been tremendously supportive, and I would not have been able to return to research sciences without them. The cryptococcus are environmental fungi that are inhaled as desiccated yeast or spores into the lungs. If they take root in those that are immunocompromised or have weakened immune systems, it could disseminate to the central nervous system and the brain to cause a, crypt a fatal cryptococcal meningitis. It's estimated there's at least 200,000 deaths annually, and the majority of those um, are in HIV AIDS patients. So the species that I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, are Cryptococcus neoformans species complex, and that consists of both neoformans, serotype A, a, and D neoformins known as serotype D. Serotype A is more virulent than serotype D and more associated with cases of cryptococcal meningitis. However, um, serotype D can also cause cryptococcal meningitis, but is more commonly associated with skin infections and is more commonly found in Europe as opposed to sub-Saharan Africa. The particular isolate that we work with in the laboratory is called XL280. And it is the product of a clinical and environmental strain. Some of its properties are that it's hyperfilamentous, it's virulent in mice, and like other serotype D strains, it's also sensitive um, to heat stress. So it has reduced growth, reduced growth in those conditions. It's probably um, one of the reasons why it's less virulent as well. The cryptococcus, again, is a budding yeast, and it's remarkably adaptive in a host infection. So for example, we can see here cryptococcus actually growing inside host cell macrophages, despite all of the assaults against it. In addition, we see that cryptococcus can form these um, balloon in size and form these giant titan cells with double or quadruple its genomic content, which then makes it resistant to phagocytosis and also resistant to antifungal drugs. During a host infection, cryptococcus is exposed to high temperature stress, changes in pH depending on where it is in the body, and also other stresses such as oxidative and, and nitrosative stresses to name a few. In addition, treatment with antifungals can allow these um, cryptococcus to develop drug resistance during infection. And I just wanna point out that thermotolerance is a key characteristic of pathogenic fungi. And those fungi that are unable to survive high temperatures are also unable to cause disease. So Cryptococcus exhibits a great deal of genome plasticity. Um, some of those changes that occur can be SNPs, indels, copy number variation, famously aneuploidy in the case of azole drug resistance, and also recombination events. And as I was learning about Cryptococcus and Canada um, specifically, uh, I took some time to review this uh, in a recently published review. Cryptococcal reproduction is primarily clonal in the environment in the host. So this raises an important question about what kind of spontaneous genetic changes can occur during that growth to allow for variation and adaptation, particularly during infection. To answer this question, um, we grew XL280 both in cultures and also um, infected them in mice. And we've infected by retroorbital injection and intravenous infection. And then, um, isolated cryptococcal cells from the lungs, brain, and kidneys in mice that were um, 
at day four and day 10 post-infection. Those organs were, were harvested and the total cryptococcal cells were um, extracted, as well as those colonies that were resistant to 5-FOA in the medium. And this would allow us to find loss of function mutations in either the Euro3 or Euro5 reporter gene. But what we found was um, published recently or last year in a publication. And surprisingly, we found that transposons made up the bulk of these mutations. And I'll just show you some key points from that study. What I'm showing you here is uh, a PCR amplification of the Euro5 gene, which is a 1KB size pro, um, gene. And you can see that there are these large three to five KB insertions that appeared in a number of those Euro5 mutants that we isolated from mouse lungs. And what was also fascinating was that if we compared growth in culture at 30 degrees or 37 degrees, we saw a, a similar pattern of upregular or um, a number of insertions that occurred at 37 degrees, but which occurred far frequently, less frequently at 30 degrees. So this appeared that heat stress was sufficient to increase these insertions in vitro. The two transposons that we identified are called T1 and TCN12. So what are transposable elements? Well, these are mobile DNA elements that can disrupt gene function or alter gene expression when they move, depending on where they move in the genome. And there are two major families. One are the DNA transposons, which act by uh, a transposage, which excises the transposon from one site in the, in the genome to another. And that's known as a cut and paste movement. T1 falls in this category. And we also have the retro transposons, which act through an intermediate RNA, which is reverse transcribed and then integrated into a second site in the locus. Um, this is known as a copy and paste movement and TCN12 exhibits this behavior. Look at some of the key data from the published paper and we see that, um, see that the drug resistant rates was increased for 5-FOA by 25 fold if we compare growth at 30 degrees versus 37. Importantly, um, we also showed that resistance to clinical antifungals, such as rapamycin FK506 and 5-flucytosine, which is used to treat um, patients with cryptococcosis, is also increased up to 28 fold at 37 degrees. The resistant rate was increased not only for transposonal elements, but also for non-TE mutations. As you can see here, we also saw a sevenfold increase, um, which we still have not characterized what these are, but that's a project for the summer students coming in the lab. So we found both uh, T1 insertions were found at both 30 degrees and 37 degrees, but there was a large increase at 37 degrees. And for TCN12, we found no insertions at 30 and only at 37 degrees, the higher temperature. Importantly, we found that this phenotype extended to several C. deniaformans clinical and environmental isolates. And uh, finally, this temperature dependent mobility was largely independent of RNA interference. And RNA interference is a common mechanism of suppression for TE movement that's been shown to be active in cryptococcus deniaformans and deniaformans. So something that's very interesting is that cryptococcus has the highest TE content among both pathogenic and non-pathogenic model yeast species. And I'm comparing here cryptococcus to Canada albicans, for example, and also the non-pathogenic Saccharomyces cerevisiae and S. pombi. It contains both DNA transposons and retrotransposons, both LTR and non-LTR. So far, there have been 25 unique TEs annotated in sequenced cryptococcal genomes, and I have a feeling that's a low estimate just based on evidence that we've seen in the laboratory. So why is this important? Well, Arturo Casadevall, who's one of the leading mycologists, has been alarming, um, sounding this alarm bell for a number of years in that climate change and global warming are likely to bring new fungal diseases for mammals and, and humans as well. And there had been, there was a review article that was just published and also this um, article that came out talking about the emergence of fungal pathogens in light of climate change. 95% of fungal species are inhibited by the core body temperature of 37 degrees. So unfortunately, rising global temperatures will expose these environmental fungi to greater heat stress. Also, climate changes could lead to increased fungal spore dispersal. We have now linked heat stress to an increased mutation rate in environmental fungus. 
Incidentally, this is the first report of heat stress induced TE mutation in any model yeast species. So therefore the mechanism is unknown. Stress induced mutation may lead to the rapid development of adaptive pathogenic traits in fungi. And just to name a few, this could contribute to the evolution of thermotolerance among non-pathogenic environmental fungi, and also could contribute to microevolution of antifungal drug resistant during persistent infections, particularly because um, cryptococcus, for example, can persist in a host infection for months in patients. This idea that environmental shocks could stimulate the mobility of genetic elements was first proposed by Barbara McClintock uh, in 1984, and she's sort of the mother of transposable elements since it was her discovery of these elements in maize many years ago. Similarly, we propose that temperature-dependent mobilization of peas could serve as an adaptive strategy to enhance survival, drug resistance, and pathogenesis of cryptococcus. It's also possible I should point out that the opposite is true and that these mobile elements could result in a decrease in fitness. And that's something that we'll, we'll have to find out as we go. So from our initial study, I had many more questions. Um, and namely, what is more of the genome-wide impact? So using the reporter system, we only were able to survey about less than 5 kb of a 19 megabase genome. So clearly, you know, we could be missing things. I also wanted to know what is the effect on phenotypic variation? Where are these mobile elements located in the genome? Do they have preferred sites of insertion? And importantly, were there other TEs that are mobilized in response to heat stress? Our challenge was how could we assess genome-wide TE movements? And our approach was to sequence the XL280 genome to identify existing copies. Then we would generate transposon accumulation lines uh, and grow those lines at different temperatures. Finally, we could map any novel insertions precisely um, using next generation sequencing techniques. So to provide a little bit of context, most of the TEs in Cryptococcus are located within the centromeres of chromosomes. And what I'm showing you here are C. neoformans and C. d. neoformans, which is a sister species, and all of these colors indicate different retro elements that are present there. The expression and mobility of these elements is likely suppressed by DNA methylation and heterochromatin at the centromeres. So when we performed, um, and Vikas performed a genome assembly using nanopore and alumina sequencing, we were able to look genome-wide at all 14 chromosomes in XL280. And we found that there was only a single copy of TCN12 on chromosome 13, and there were five native copies with similar sequences on uh, additional chromosomes. Importantly, those mobile elements are located outside of the centromeres. And also because you can detect this with nanopore sequencing, Vikas was able to show that they are not CPG methylated. This could be another reason why they're mobile. I just want to point out here that we did find also evidence of a number of truncated non-mobile copies um, that are evidence for ancestral movements in the genome. So the way that we generated our transposon accumulation lines was by single colony passage on nutrient-rich medium. For those uh, colonies that were grown at 30 degrees, uh, we grew them for two days, and for those at 37 degrees, 30, um, we grew them for three days so that they would reach approximately the same colony size, since it does have that growth defect at 37 degrees. We looked at a total of 42 independent lines maintained for uh, about 800 generations. As far as identifying and mapping them, we used a variety of techniques uh, were both old school Southern analysis and also new school TE mapping techniques using short read sequencing and also long read sequencing with nanopore. One thing I want to just point out and pause and say, if you're not looking for transposons, you might not find them. This is uh, Johnny Williams, who was the postdoc that preceded me, and he actually made the heat mobile tea discovery um, in, in, in culture. And what he found was when he first was PCRing for the Euro 5 gene in this case, he found that there was just a bunch of fails that appeared. And fortunately, Joe Heitman down the hallway had seen this um, happen before. And he suggested Johnny try conditions um, with a better tack polymerase and also um, unique PCR amplification conditions. And lo and behold, the transposons appeared. 
Similarly, if you use Illumina short read sequencing by traditional methods, uh, where you have to map the reads back to the reference genome, a lot of them, because the transposons are so large, will get discarded into, as unmapped reads. So to combat this, Cullen adapted, um, Cullen Roth from the McGuinney Lab adapted, adapted the relocate TE mapping system, which has an anchor read to the reference genome and also an anchor read to the specific TE that we were looking for, T1 or TCN12, to make sure that those transposons were captured in our analysis. So what did we find? What I'm showing you here are T1 and TCN12 insertions across all 42 passage um, genomes. And on the left-hand side are those isolates that were passage at 30 degrees. On the right-hand side are those that were passage at 37 degrees. And immediately you can see that there were many more insertions at 37 degrees, largely due to the TCN12 insertions, the dark bars, that, which are represented by the dark bars here. We were a bit surprised, though, to find that the number of T1 insertions occurring in passage isolates at 30 degrees versus 37 degrees, there didn't seem to be a significant increase as we saw in the reporter assays. And we wondered um, whether or not this difference could be due to liquid versus plate passage. So the reporter assays that we used were performed in liquid media. Eva May Shaus, who's a research technician in the laboratory, followed up on this and looked at movements in liquid culture, um, passaging for 400 generations, so just half the, half the time. And on the left here are, is a probe for TCN12. We see that single copy chromosome 13. And you can see that there's no movements at 30 degrees versus several that appear in the passage isolates at 37 degrees. For T1, we did find results that were more consistent with what we found in the reporter assays in that after only 400 generations, you can see many more insertions occurring in the passage isolates at 37 versus 30 degrees. So if anyone has thoughts on why there might be a difference between plate passage and liquid culture, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. If we take a look genome-wide um, at distribution of transposon insertions, I'm showing you the novel transposon insertions by triangles here. You can see that for TCN12, we found a pretty equal distribution across the genome. And for those that were mapped for T1, also we saw a lot of um, uh, just an equal distribution across the genome. If we take a closer look at TCN12, the retro transposon, we found that um, over 80% of the insertions were within gene coding regions. And perhaps this is not too surprising because um, the cryptococcal genome is extremely gene dense. 85% of the genome is gene coding, whereas only 15% is non-coding, including the intergenic regions and centromeres and telomeres. Further, um, I'm exploring this idea that PCN12 may have some target sequence specificity. When I aligned um, all the insertion sites with the target site duplication in the center where the uh, transposon inserts, uh, we find this pattern across all of those spontaneous mutations where there's um, certain bases that appear to be enriched at certain locations. And when I compared this to those insertions that we found in the Euro 5 reporter gene, for example, I'm seeing sort of a similar pattern emerging. And I also want to point out that we found virtually no insertions of TCN12 in the Euro 3 reporter, um, whereas we found many T1 insertions there. And there was also a hot spot in TCN in, in the Euro 5 reporter, which is similar to this sequence as well. If we take a look at P1 DNA transposon, we found some very interesting things. Well, um, what, I'm, what I'm showing you here is just one, of, one single passage isolate, the one that had the most transposon insertions, nine T1 insertions and one TCN12 insertion, isolate 37-2. And on the left, we can see and highlighted in yellow all of the new copies where they appeared. Further, we were able to sequence those copies and found that all of the unique T1 insertions are mobile. And I should just point out that T1.4 and 5 have the identical sequence, so it's tough. We can't really distinguish between those movements. When we looked at the gene level, we very early found this interesting pattern where we would find that most of the T1 insertions were occurring between genes. In fact, 88% of these occurred between genes, and only 8% were within genes. And this was quite surprising because it probably means that we missed a number of T1 insertions with our reporter assays in that they were, they were um, assessing gene, uh, gene loss or gene function loss. Only 
we wanted to explore this a little bit further and look at the relative proportion of um, genes with a tandem orientation, a divergent orientation, and a convergent orientation in the XL280 genome specifically. We would expect, based on the, our calculations, about 40% of those insertions to occur between um, divergently transcribed genes. In fact, we found 60% were in between divergently transcribed genes. And furthermore, um, there were no T1 insertions that we found between convergent genes. So this led us to think, is it possible that there could be an issue of chromatin accessibility or there could be a link between transcription and um, insertions of these elements? When I looked at insertions between genes, either in the tandem or divergent, orientation, I found that the majority were located within just 200 base pairs upstream of the nearest start of transcription. So I'm really fascinated about this. And it, what, what's also more remarkable is that a single T1 insertion could affect transcription on, and gene expression on either side, resulting in much more phenotypic variation. But to look at this a little bit further, I performed um, qPCR analysis of genes proximal to the T1 insertion in between divergent, uh, divergently transcribed uh, promoters. And what you can see here um, for isolate 37.1, for example, we saw a really dramatic shifts in gene expression to no change at all. Um, and similarly, we can find various changes in gene expression compared to the wild type. It was notable that there was increased transcript detected for nine of 12 genes that we've looked at so far. And I'd like to do some control experiments to see if this is really true uh, and figure out exactly what that could mean if this trend continues. But either way, it's likely that these, are, um, these insertions will have effect on uh, genes on either side of the insertion site. But as we use nanopore sequencing, that allowed us to look at the entire genome and identify whether or not there are other elements moving that we may have missed with our reporter assays and also with the uh, Illumina short read sequencing technique. As Vikas was doing the um, analysis on the passage isolates, he came across the fact that CNL1 also was heat mobile. Now CNL1 is the most prevalent TE in Cryptococcus and it's found in tandem arrays near the telomeres of chromosome, a, a number of chromosomes. Interestingly, it preferentially inserts into itself and telomere-like sequences. When I probe um, the passage isolate for CNL1, um, and you can see the wild type pattern appears here, I saw that there was a shuffling um, and definitely movements or losses of, of CNL1 elements across uh, the um, isolate's passage of 30 degrees. But what was very striking was this significant enrichment and amplification of bands that appeared at, in the isolate's passage at 37 degrees. Uh, and it turns out uh, Vikas is in the process of sort of mapping what some of these uh, ends of chromosomes look like, but we they're actually dramatic amplifications, so we're sort of just in the telomeric regions. So this is probably why we didn't see them in the reporter assays because they're not jumping into uh, open reading frames. So with those seven passage isolates that were sequenced by nanopore, we were able to look at the total copies of TEs that had accumulated in a passage isolates versus uh, the wild type genome. And what I'm showing you here are the number of copies of the transposable elements in XL280 wild type with those highlighting just for 37.2 since we've been using that example. And you can see that for TCN12, the copies increased by one. For T1, they increased by nine. And for CNL1, they increased by a whopping 40 in number. And that's just to count the full length copies. There are actually a lot of fragments of elements that were um, produced uh, after passage at 37 degrees as well. So this finding asked us, um, or forced us to revisit the cryptococcus that we recovered from mice to see whether or not there could be um, other T1 insert or other insertions that we missed in single isolates. Could there also be movement of CNL1? So I looked at isolates that were isolated from Cryptococcus after 10 days post infection. And these isolates were known to have a single T1 or TCN12 insertion in either the Euro3 or Euro5 gene, as they were 5-FOA resistant. What I found um, was quite striking in that multiple independent isolates showed multiple movements 
And I'll draw your attention just to uh, lane 12, which has a single isolate that was recovered from the brain. This isolate has a single TCN12 insertion that happened to be in the Euro5 gene. And when we looked at that same isolate probe for T1, we can see that there's new insertions uh, for T1, two new insertions and also losses of bands at um, different places in the genome. We also saw multiple movements and shifts in CNL1 in the same isolate. So this was um, pretty striking um, to us and it made me wonder whether or not there was a lot of movement potentially occurring during persistent crypt cryptococcal infections. So I've started a collaborative project with uh, the Perfect Lab to look at uh, isolates that come from recurrent cryptococcal infections to see if we can find any evidence that there's mobility of these trans of transposable elements during infection by comparing incident and relapse isolate. So to sort of wrap up, I just wanted to um, emphasize that heat stress may be a potent stimulus for TE-mediated phenotypic variation and adaptation, both in the environment and during infection. And it's definitely true that the identity, copy number, and location of elements will impact their effect on individual genomes. And finally, that long read genomes hold sequencing, which we're able to do a lot more readily now, is really the best tool for identifying TE movements and studying genomic changes. Future work, um, I definitely would like to expand this analysis to include other cryptococcal species. I really wanna focus on the mechanism of heat stress-induced mobility. Um, and also to characterize those non-TE mutations that were increased during heat stress. Finally, I'd like to assess whether there are stressors other um, than heat stress that can cause the mutation rate to increase in cryptococcus. And I probably, I'll just wrap here to tell you that um, we've identified elements that are responsive to heat only, to both heat and control of RNAi, and then we, I didn't talk about T2 and T3, but these elements are not responsive to heat, but are controlled by RNAi. So with that, I would just like to wrap and say thank you to all of my collaborators and researchers, and I look forward to answering your questions after Benoit's talk. Thanks so much, Ace. That was a great talk. I'll just pass you off to Jessica, who's gonna introduce our next speaker. Great, thank you very much. Um, so please enter your questions into the chat and um, we will take them all at the end. So if you can call out the speaker by name, that would make it a little bit easier, but if you don't, don't worry about that. Uh, I also just launched the poll on what sorts of things people would like um, in terms of social or mentoring events associated with this talk series. Um, so please answer that whenever you get the chance. Uh, and now I would like to introduce our second speaker, uh, Benoit uh, Briard. And Benoit is currently, has, has just recently launched his own group at INSRM in France. Um, and prior to that, he completed his PhD at uh, Institut Pasteur and then did his postdoc at St. Jude's in Tennessee um, before returning um, to France. And so today he's going to talk to us about the inflammasome and galactosaminoglactan. Benoit? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Jessica, for the introduction. So, yeah, uh, so this work has been done in, um, during my postdoc uh, at St. Jude in the lab of uh, uh, Dr. Caneganti. And <clears throat> we were interesting about the um, the world of uh, galactosaminogalactan in activation of uh, inflammasomes. <clears throat> so, usually I'm doing like a quick introduction of what it's Aspergillus fumigatus, but I think here everybody knows most of this. And, um, but uh, Aspergillus, it's a um, saprophytic filamentous fungus. So, and um, it's a very ubiquitous fungi. So, it's producing uh, spores, like we are calling conidia. And those conidia are present in atmosphere. And um, uh, every day we are in uh, hundreds of those conidia. And uh, due to that, uh, Aspergillus fumigatus, it's an um, opportunist, opportunistic pathogen. Um, so <clears throat> we are breathing, and due to the small size of the conidia, like between two and four micrometer, um, uh, those conidia can penetrate uh, very uh, deeply in the lungs. And it can start to grow uh, <clears throat> in the immunodeficient patient. So, but against Aspergillus, we have like, uh, 
a lot of defense. And the first line are the EPTL cells that can block the entry of the pathogen and like with um, um, remove the conidia. And after we have like very specialized um, cells like uh, macrophages, alveolar macrophages or dendritic cells, in, uh, which are producing like cytokines also, which can recruit other um, um, specialized um, cells like neutrophils. And those neutrophils like uh, can um, kill uh, the fungus and particularly if the fungus start to grow. So <clears throat> those cells are uh, equipped with um, pathogen recognition receptors, the PRR. And uh, those PRR, um, the innate immune sensor for the danger-associated molecular patents, the DEMPs, and the pathogen-associated molecular patents, the PEMPs, which we are very interested here. And those PEMPs are present at the surface of the pathogens, uh, which are, can be like the bacteria, the virus, and also fungi. And um, <clears throat> we have um, two types of PRR. We have the membrane bone receptors, um, like the setup lectin receptors, CLRs, right here, and the toll like receptors, TLRs, which can recognize uh, the dams, uh, the PEMPs from the pathogens. And those pathogens uh, will be uh, phagocytosis, and uh, some of those pathogens can uh, escape of these uh, phagosomes and invite the cytosome of the cells. To respond to this uh, uh, invasion, we have um, other receptors, the cytosolic receptors. Um, those are the DNA sensors, the nod like receptors are the rigai like receptors. So those uh, cytosolic cells are so inflammasome, it's um, a multi protein complex uh, which mediate activation of caspase one. There is plenty of inflammasomes and with different res uh, receptors. So we have the NRP1B inflammasome, NRP3 inflammasome, the most well known. Uh, we have also the NRC4 inflammasome, uh, M2 inflammasome, and parvin inflammasome. And <clears throat> the organization of inflammasome is pretty simple. So you have the sensor. Uh, which gives the name of the inflammasome. Then you have the adaptive protein, a protein husk. Then when the sensor detects the PAMS <clears throat> or the ligands, and this one will uh, recruit the, pr the protein husk and then recruit the uh, protein caspase 1. So um, caspase 1 is going to be activated. Once uh, caspase 1 is activated, this one will um, induce the inflammation uh, with the, the processing of the pro-inflammatory um, cytokine pro ela one beta on ELA18 and, and give like the active form and also will mediate uh, the cell death called uh, pyroptosis. So this one is a very inflammatory uh, cell death. And this is due to the cleavage of the molecule gastamine D by caspas one So <clears throat> when I start my uh, postdoctorate, uh, in the laboratory of Dr. Kaneganti, um, it was known that Aspergillus fumigatus engages uh, two inflammasome receptors, the NRP3 inflammasome and the M2 inflammasome. But beyond that, the molecular mechanism was uh, still unknown on how uh, the inflammasome get activated in response to uh, Aspergillus fumigatus. So this was the first part of my project and like to try to decipher uh, how uh, Aspergillus fumigatus is uh, recognized by the cells and activate inflammasome. So mostly this, it's not the most important for today, but we, um, Aspergillus is gonna be uh, um, recognized by cellular pathway and cellular pathway. The cellular pathway will uh, mediate the priming of the cells and <clears throat> will um, permit the expression of the transcription factor F1. Then F1 is gonna be activated through the TLA pathway, which uh, will um, um, express, will start to express uh, the um, interfundicible genes like the protein ERGB10. 
ERGB10, it's um, uh, Interphone uh, GTP ASIS, and this one will target the cell surface of uh, the fungus. And <clears throat> we show that this um, protein, ERGB10, will uh, remove some pumps of the fungus, and this is necessary for activation, activation of the inflammatory. Um, but after that, we still don't, don't know um, which pumps are necessary for the inflammasome activation in response to Asperger's fumigatus. And this was the second part. How Asperger's fumigatus induce inflammasome activation? Which pumps is going to be recognized uh, by the cells to trigger inflammasome inflammasomes? For the bacteria, <clears throat> I show only the bacteria here, but also for virus, this is very well known. We have plenty of pumps. We have like the LPS. We have the flagellin for the um, um, flagellin for the NC4 inflammasome. LPS for the non-canonical NRP3 inflammasome. We have the double strand DNA of the bacteria uh, for the AIM2 inflammasome. We have the type 3 secretion system for also C4 or toxin for uh, parin, uh, P3, C4, etc. But for fungus, we was, uh, this is uh, very less characterized, and especially for Asperger's fungus. So when I go back on the literature, what was shown that the resting conidia of Asperger's fungus can't activate inflammasome, but the germinating conidia and hashi activate the inflammasome. So if you're looking at the surface of the conidia and the germinating conidia, we have like very uh, different uh, pattern. And on the surface of the resting conidia, you can see the rodent layer, so dosidrophobins, and also the melanin layer. Then when the conidia start to grow and <coughs> to uh, germinate, we have like modification of the surface. We are losing the rodent layer, the melanin layer, and we are expressing new polysaccharide uh, called like the galactose aminogalactan, the GAC. And for that, we was very interesting to understand the role of this galactose aminogalactan, the GAG, in activation on inflammasome, and if this one can have any roles. So, <clears throat> first of all, we, we want to identify so what's the yeah sorry what's the the, the um, galactose aminogalactan. So this is a structure. So <clears throat> it's um, uh, a polysaccharide which is composed of. Um, galactose, N-acetylgalactosamine, and galactosamine. So to simplify, we, we can use uh, this symbol, like galactose, uh, N-acetylgalactosamine, and galactosamine. So <clears throat> we, the, the, the gag has been uh, discovered uh, in my previous lab in Pasteur at Paris, and uh, like 10 years ago, and the pathway has been like hardly um, identified, but Still, the galactose aminogalactan uh, synthase was missing, and we was interesting to uh, identify this one. So, <clears throat> by uh, bioinformatic analysis, we identify the GT4C, which is uh, potentially the GAC synthase, and um, <clears throat> we create uh, a mutant of Aspergillus, like deleted in the GT4C uh, genes, and <clears throat> we uh, analyze the composition of the cell wall. Um, as you can observe here, so in blue, it's a mutant, a delta GT4C, and the composition of uh, galactosamine here, which is totally dependent of the uh, uh, in presence of GAG in the cell wall of Aspergillus, it's missing totally uh, in the mutant. And is here, as, uh, it's similar in the acalisoluble fraction. So that means we are missing galactose aminogalactan, the GAG, in the delta GT4C uh, mutant of Asperger's fumigatus. So we double check uh, the presence, uh, mostly the absence of GAG uh, in the mutant um, uh, GT4C. Um, as you can observe here, you have the fibrils, you have the extra uh, cellular matrix present on the surface of the um, IFE, and this is very characteristic of GAG. And here in the mutant, we don't have any uh, fibrils, we don't have uh, extra cellular matrix. So our first conclusion is that the GT4C, it's uh, the GAC synthase of Asperger's fumigatus. So now <clears throat> we have a tool to study the role of uh, a GAG uh, in inflammasome activation, and we, we can infect uh, the macrophage with it. 
So first of all, we, we try to identify and uh, to see if uh, Asperger's miniatus produces a gag inside the uh, macrophage during the infection. So for that, we have a uh, um, specific antibody against the gag. And as you can observe here in green, uh, during the infection of uh, macrophages, uh, bone marrow derived macrophages, you have a production of gag, and this one it's uh, present inside the site of, of the macrophages. So <clears throat> then we try to uh, see if uh, gag is important for inflammasome activation. And for inflammasome activation, we have a very simple uh, readout, which is the activation of the caspase one. So I told you that if you have an assembly, uh, assembly of inflammasome, you have the cleavage of the caspase one. So here at P45, you have like the proform of caspase one. And if you have activation here in this line, you have the cleavage and you have this P20 band, which appear. So here, if you um, infect the white type BMDMs with uh, white type Asperger's fumiatus, you have the cleavage of caspase one, which means you have like activation of lamazone. Following, you have the active, we have the cleavage of pro E1 beta in uh, E1 beta active form and release of this um, active uh, cytokine. But <clears throat> with a mutant of Aspergillus without, uh, uh, without the GAC synthase, the GT4C mutant, you don't have the cleavage with, of caspase one and you don't have the release of field one beta. So the clear conclusion was that um, a GAG <clears throat> can, uh, is necessary for the activation of inflammasome during Aspergillus fumitus infection. So <clears throat> then um, we, we try to understand <clears throat> To, to show the opposite. So what happens if you um, uh, overproduce a gag? And for that, we use a mutant of Aspergillus, the mutant uh, Delta UGM1. So <clears throat> this one, it's a known to produce, to overproduce uh, galactosaminogalactan. And <clears throat> as you can observe, like you have like more uh, production of gag uh, during the infection. And um, if you can observe here on this western blot, uh, during the infection with this mutant UGM1, which is producing more gag, you have like more cleavage of caspase 1, meaning you have more activation of flamazone. And this is followed by the release of uh, IL-1 beta here. So the activation of uh, inflammasome in response to Aspergillus was totally dependent of the production of galactosaminogalactan. So <clears throat> this is um, the, the first summary. And uh, what we show is that the GT4C, it's uh, the gag synthesis of uh, Aspergillus fumigatus, uh, which is necessary for the gag, the gag production. And this gag mediates activation of inflammasome. So then we want to um, understand the mechanism behind this uh, inflammasome activation by gag. And first of all, uh, we try to understand if the gag alone can activate inflammasome. And it's what we did here. And as you can observe, if you translate gag in this line here, you have the cleavage of caspase 1. And you have this P20 band, which appear right here. Flagellin is a, a positive control. As I said during the introduction, uh, flagellin uh, activates the NLC4 uh, inflammasome. And <clears throat> I told you also that uh, activation of uh, inflammasome mediates the cell death, we call uh, pyroptosis. And as you can observe here, during the transcription of GAG, you have like a strong induction of cell death. And you can observe here the pictures like showing like very pyroptotic cell death, uh, which uh, with a very condensate uh, nucleus. <clears throat> so <clears throat> then I told you that Aspergillus fumigatus activate two types of inflammasome, the NIP3 and AIM2, and we try to understand which one um, GAG uh, activates. And for that, we uh, transfect the GAG into um, the BMDMs lacking uh, NLP3 or uh, AM2 receptors. And as you can observe, only the BMDMs lacking NLP3 receptors uh, can't activate uh, inflammasomes. So <clears throat> GAG mediates uh, NLP3 inflammasome activation. 
So <clears throat> then we try to uh, understand the mechanism and <clears throat> which part of the gag it's necessary for the activation on aflamazone. So I, I show you this uh, here. So it's composed of GAG, uh, the galactose, uh, N-acetylgalactosamine, and galactosamine. And we know that for polysaccharide, the acetyl form uh, of uh, GALNAC is very important for the bioactivity of polysaccharide and bioactivity of GAG. So <clears throat> we try to understand <clears throat> if this is necessary for the activation of aflamazone. And what we did, we generate uh, an acetylated gag, we call AC gag. So this one has only uh, galnac and no galactosamine, or the deacetylated gag, D gag. So it's only um, a presence of galactosamine at the uh, inside. So <clears throat> then we, uh, do, uh, we did the same and we transfect uh, those uh, different type of GAG into BMDMs. And as you can observe, the GAG activate uh, inflammasome, the D GAG, so the one with uh, only galactosamine activate GAG, uh, the inflammasome, but the acetylid GAG, it's not, it's very reduced. And this is also followed by the uh, induction of cell death. So in red here, you have uh, the gag, the normal gag, and <clears throat> the acetylated gag as a cell, the cell death is very dr drastically uh, reduced. So <clears throat> we conclude that um, this is uh, the activation of um, the activation of inflammasome by gag is dependent of the acetylation or mostly the deacetylation. So then this we, we, we did by biochemistry and with a pure gag, but what happened with the bug? What happened <clears throat> uh, um, with aspergillus during the affection? So the gag it's produced from a monomer, the so UDP gal and UDP galnac, and this is synthesized by the GT40. And <clears throat> the deacetylation, so the formation of galactosamine, it's made after the synthesis of GAG. And this has been discovered before and uh, the mutant has been generated. So this is, uh, is due to the, uh, the enzyme AGD3. So this one, it's a uh, deacetylase and you use, we use this mutant, a Delta AGD3. So that means this mutant Delta AGD3 doesn't produce um, a galactosamine. It's only acetylic GAG. And as you can observe, if you infect macrophages, the bond BMTMs, with this mutant, Delta GD3, which is still producing GAG, but only acetylic GAG, you don't have activation of inflammasomes. So <clears throat> that's confirmed the galactosamine of GAG and this is NRP3 inflammasome activation. So <clears throat> then <clears throat> we want to understand the mechanism uh, uh, from the cells and to identify how GAG activate inflammasome. And <clears throat> what we did, it's like a, a, it's a, a pulled on assay and, um, a prote um, and we analyzed by uh, mass spectrometry, the protein from macrophages binding on the, macrophage, on the GAG of Aspergillus fumiatus. And uh, surprisingly, we observed that most of the protein was the ribosomal proteins. And um, we confirm this by uh, Western bloating. And as you can observe, the GAG, it's interacting with ribosomal protein, strongly interacting with the ribosomal protein, which a D-GAG is pro it's also an, uh, interacting with this one. Whereas uh, the acetyl GAG, the one which is not uh, activating inflammasome, can't um, uh, interact with uh, ribosomal protein. And here we have like a negative control with the beta glucan. And we showed that uh, this uh, interaction between uh, ribosomal protein and GAG was dependent of uh, heterostatic interaction. And <clears throat> uh, then we conclude that the galactosamine of GAG interact with the ribosomes and potentially with uh, polysomes. And um, to confirm that, and we, we try to understand the role of GAG in the um, transcription. So, if I do a, a quick remember transcription, you have like a different step and we try to understand which step it's um, 
perturbated by a gag. And you have this initiation. So we have the formation of the 18S unit on the mRNA. And then you have the elongation of, um, uh, for the protein. And then you have the termination. So <clears throat> what we did is to see if um, the gag will perturbate the, um, uh, the, the transcription uh, of the macrophages. And uh, for that, we did a, a technique like a pulchase technique. So we use um, a promycin. So the promycin, uh, if you treat the cells with promycin, this, this uh, promycin will uh, integrate the neosynthesized uh, protein. And then we can probe for promycin and see the integration. So here you have the control, a normal one, and you can see at this time you have like uh, the transcription rate and, uh, of the cells. And if you transfix the gag, you inhibit the transcription. You strongly inhibit this transcription. If you use a D-gag, it's similar, you inhibit the transcription. But uh, here, uh, with the acetylic gag, you don't have. So that means uh, the gag, the transcription of gag inhibits the transcription of microphones. So then to identify which step of uh, transcription was inhibited by a gag, we did uh, polysome profiling. And uh, here in black, you have the control with the tap, and in red, we have like the gag the transcription. And as you can observe here, so you have like a very strong inhibition of, uh, I think this is, uh, this is um, due to the, the problem with GAG. Um, <clears throat> but we, what we did, we, we calculated the ratio between a polysome and the monosome. And as you can observe, you have an increased uh, polysome fraction compared to the monosome. So that means we inhibit uh, the termination of the trans, um, transcription of the macrophages during the, um, the transfection of um, gag, gag, galactose aminogalactate. So <clears throat> we conclude that the galactose aminogalactam um, interact with ribosome and inhibit the translation and induce an RP3 uh, inflammasome activation. So <clears throat> to understand how uh, inhibition of uh, translation can um, activate inflammasome, we, we look at the um, reticulum endoplasmic stress because it has been linked that the um, reticulum stress uh, can uh, mediate an uh, RP3 uh, inflammasome activation. And for that, we, we, we look at the markers for the reticulum endoplasmic stress, like activation of pair pathway on ERE1 alpha pathway, and we observe the activation of this one, of this pathway. So confirming the uh, endoplasmic stress during Asperger's Fungitus infection. And what we observe also is like um, 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 ubiquitination of protein during the transfection of GAG is very increased. So that means we have like misfold and also proteins. And we were very interesting to look at the role of a uh, proteasome because uh, those proteins need to be uh, taken in charge by uh, proteasome. And <clears throat> we use an inhibitor of proteasome, the MG132, uh, during the translation of GAG. And you, we observe that this uh, inhibition of proteasome like, can rescue the inflammasome activation during GAG translation. So our conclusion is that um, GAG induces reticulum, uh, endoplasmic reticulum stress, and um, this one will activate strongly proteasomes, which may get some inflammasome. So now what happened in vivo? So we use a mutant of Asperger's fumiatus uh, in um, a pulmonary Asperger's model. So this mutant, Delta UGM1, I show you at the beginning, uh, and use, uh, produce very uh, a, a large quantity of GAG. And you can observe that compared to the white type strain of Asperger's fumiatus, you have um, a less, um, uh, you, you have, so this strain is less, um, uh, oh, sorry, um, it's, um, those mice are less susceptible to the Delta GM1 uh, strains. So mm, mm, um, then we showed that this was dependent of inflammasome. So this is very complicated, uh, but I will help you to understand. So 
We use a MUIT as a mice, like which are like in Caspase 1 and Caspase 11. So those mice can't activate inflammasome. So these mice are with a line <coughs> uh, here and the dot one are the white type mice. So if you are looking the line here, the mice which are uh, infected uh, either by um, white type Asperger's fumiatus or the uh, Delta UGM1 uh, um, uh, strain of Asperger's fumiatus are susceptible and are dying, which means that was dependent of Caspase 1 and Caspase 11, which is uh, inflammasome. So <clears throat> then we use a mutant, uh, the GT4C, the one we generate and uh, which is not producing GAG. But when we try this mutant in a pulmonary uh, infection model, uh, this, uh, we, we didn't observe any differences. But in the systemic model, which is pretty artificial, but we observe uh, uh, a clear difference at the beginning, which the GT4C mutant was like more variant at, at the beginning of the infection. So GAG and the use activation of inflammasome provide host protection uh, against uh, aspergillosis. So <clears throat> then we use another model, uh, which is independent of aspergillus fungatus, but um, where the inflammasome is uh, very crucial, it's a colitis. And we use a DSS uh, colitis, um, DSS and uses colitis, and we treat the mice. So this has been shown before that GAG was uh, protecting the mice uh, against the SS and using colitis. So we repeat the experiment and observe the same uh, pattern so that the, um, the protection of uh, the mice, you, the mice are not losing weight, the uh, score of the colon is uh, it's very low and the mice are protected. And as you can observe here with uh, the, the, the pictures of uh, HNE, and, but what we observe is that the mice uh, which are treated with a gag are, are producing a large uh, quantity of E18. And E18 is a cytokine which is dependent of inflammasome. And all the pro-inflammatory cytokines, the other cytokine was down because we have less inflammation, but E18 was very upregulated. So meaning we have uh, potentially uh, more activation on inflammasome. And when we treat the mice, the mice lacking E18 with GAG here in red, you are, we are not um, protecting these mice uh, in the model of uh, DSS and using colitis. And you have still, uh, we have uh, here it's a colon shortening, so you have like still reduction of the colon, so the mice are not protected. So <clears throat> we conclude that gag and disease activation of inflammasome provide host uh, protection against uh, DSS and uses uh, colitis. So <clears throat> this is a conclusion on wh what we show. It's uh, the GT4C produce a gag and <clears throat> the galactosamine uh, of the gag will interact with ribosome and polysome, which will uh, block the translation and inhibit uh, this one, which induce a uh, reticulum endoplasmic stress. This reticulum endoplasmic stress will uh, activate the proteasome and, uh, and using, uh, activating the NRP3 inflammatory. So <clears throat> I want to thank uh, my uh, supervisor during my postdoctoral, as a, uh, Dr. Chirmala Devi Kaneganti, and also all the lab members and past lab members uh, and uh, the, also the um, core, uh, which I use a lot for these different projects uh, from St. Jude, and also the collaborators, uh, the Institut Pasteur of Paris uh, with the lab of uh, the uh, Professor Lage, and also the different uh, other team of uh, friends. So um, I want to thank everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Benoit, for the fantastic talk. Uh, and so we'll take questions for both speakers, uh, but I'll hand it over to Liz to get us started. Thanks, Jessica. I think we'll, uh, for the sake of time, I'm gonna collapse the questions for you into three different categories, um, just so we can get uh, everyone's uh, points across. Um, so there seem to be three major questions here, um, and I think you can probably guess what they are. The first one is, what is the mechanism driving this? Uh, Tom Petey's James Hannon, Hatfield, and uh, George Amich have all asked this question. Do you have any idea how this is working? 
Right. So not yet. So I've, I've written a grant proposal to explore many of these questions that come up in the chat. Um, but definitely we want to look at the uh, impact of heat stress and of the heat shock proteins potentially. Uh, we've started some experiments looking at uh, if you inhibit the heat shock protein 90, which is involved in um, heat stress response in cryptococcus with verdisicol to see whether or not transposable elements go up. And um, so far, we've not seen an increase with those experiments. However, I'm not sure that we're using the proper amount. And so I would love to collaborate with those that are more familiar with what methods would be good to use this. I've also thought about um, overexpressing the heat shock factor one, for example, that controls a lot of, um, and to see whether or not we then get increased uh, transportable element. Uh, I thought DNA methylation would be involved here, but based on the nanopore sequencing and seeing that they're not methylated in the wild type state, I don't think that that's a control here. Interesting, okay. Okay, thanks. Jessica, do you wanna ask the first question for Benoit and then we'll come back? Uh, sure, uh, Guillaume Jambon asks, why GAG doesn't inhibit, inhibit aspergillus uh, translation? Um, <clears throat> because the gag, it's not uh, intracellular in the aspergillus. So, yeah, for that, it's a secreted uh, polysaccharide, mostly, so, and it's present on the surface of the, the cell wall. Yeah. So this is like, because it's, because aspergillus, like it's growing inside the cells and like it's releasing this gag uh, intensively. So I think mostly due to that. So you think that the um, full unit as it's synthesized is either contained within the aspergillus cell so it doesn't inhibit aspergillus translation or is secreted and then assembled into the final form? Uh, could you repeat, please? Um, Sorry. So my, my question was, uh, what form do you think the gag or the gag precursors are within the aspergillus cell during synthesis? So do you think that the 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 form that's capable of activating the inflammasome is ever inside the aspergillus cell during synthesis, or is it contained, say, in vesicles, so it's not going to inhibit aspergillus translation, no. <clears throat> or is it only the, released as a final product? Yeah, no, so the, the, the GAG synthase is present on the uh, plasma membrane, so it's directly secreted directly, and then it's activated by the AGD3 protein, so like which is forming the galactosamine part, which is mm -hmm. like at this time it's activated, but this gag it's only uh, present uh, in the cell wall and it's only secreted, so it's not inside the, the aspergillus. Great, thank you, Liz. Do you want to take the next yeah. question? Yeah, so um, I said um, Jessica, uh, Kirsten Nielsen, and um, Who's the third person? Uh, Marat Ken Kalin have all asked questions about how this translates to different species. And there's a few small um, details there. Um, Kristen is asking questions about how XL280, which is a hyperfilamentous organism, compares to strains that might not be hyperfilamentous, um, as well as how this compares to C. neoformans and C. gadii. Um, um, Murat asked a really interesting question about C. amelentis, which is a does it grow at high temperature? So might there be um, something there where it's failing to mobilize transcriptional elements. Um, and then Jessica's asking, um, uh, just in comparing serotype A and serotype D, do you see differences in mobilization between those two sister species? Okay, uh, yes. So, so to answer uh, Kristen's question first, uh, the isolates that we looked at, the other C. deniaformans isolates that we looked at were the parent strains, the clinical and environmental isolate, um, that were the parent um, strains, parent strains. Parent strains. And they do not have the filamentous phenotype. And we saw the phenotype um, in both of those isolates. We looked at a third clinical isolate that was not related as well. And we saw increase uh, due to transposable elements as well. Um, interestingly though, uh, one of the isolates that didn't show an increase was an AD hybrid. And so that was really curious to me. Um, and also I have some anecdotal, and to make a long story short, I've not tested other isolates yet. And I'm, I'm gonna look at the strain diversity collection and hopefully get into looking at neoformans and, and gadii. But uh, Shelby Priest uh, in the Heitman lab had done a little bit of work with H99 and a hypermutator strain. And uh, when she grew them at 37 degrees, she didn't see an increase in drug resistance using the FR1 reporter gene. And so it's entirely possible that uh, this could be uh, thermosensitive. Uh, isolates might have this phenotype. 
versus others. Mm -hmm. Also though, what could be possible is a, a higher temperature instead of 37 degrees where neoformis is not stressed. If we move to 38 or 39 degrees where it is stressed, we might see this phenotype. So I'm very anxious to do those, those, those studies. Okay, and great. Keep going if you want to. I can't remember if I, I missed one of those. <laughs> it's a question of, of amylentis, but I think you've, I think you've, uh, you've addressed that as well. Yeah. Go ahead, Jessica. Uh, great. So Benoit, a question from Jorge Amique, and he asks how your results compare to Don Shepard's. And so the inflammasome is, is frequently thought of sort of this Trojan horse alerting the host that the pathogen is there. Um, and Don's been using uh, corticoid steroid treated mice to make them immunocompetent. And he's shown that GAG is good for the pathogen and bad for the host. Um, do you think that uh, some of your differences are a result of the model that you're using neutropenic mice, or do you think there are other factors in play? Um, <clears throat> yeah, me, me, I use neutropenic mice and like um, I use cyclosphosphamide and uh, cortisone acetate. And uh, <clears throat> during very short time, so like to permit the infection of the mice and then remove it and we have like this infection. And yeah, I, I <clears throat> this was very controversial with uh, uh, the, the, the result from uh, Shepard showing that, yeah, it, but what I observed is that like UG, yeah, the UGM1 strain was like very, very uh, hypovalent, like comparing the other white type strain. And when I try the GT4 series strain, and which is not uh, act, um, producing any gag, I didn't observe any difference with the pulmonary infection. I observe only difference with, um, with uh, systemic infection, which is artificial for aspergillus. And, and this difference also uh, was very short. It was really at the beginning of the infection, like, like the mice was dying like very fast compared to the white type strain of aspergillus. But at the end, if you look at the, the graph, all the, the, the rate is similar, but yeah. Uh, as a short follow-up on that, do you see any differences in strains isolated from patients who are neutropenic versus strains isolated from patients who are on steroids? Um, no, I, I didn't try that. Uh, this is interesting, but uh, no. All right, Liz. Okay, so the last group of questions has to do with um, sort of like environmental relevance. I have, I'm gonna add one in here, but Keon Jambone um, has asked whether you identified any um, advantages to this transposome with in vivo. So do you see that isolates are coming out of, um, these are more fit? Um, or do you have any evidence to that effect? Um, and uh, Corrine Probst asks, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing everybody's names. Um, she says, uh, wonderful talk. Um, in your work with John Perfect, um, are you planning to analyze and correlate transfits PE movement um, with uh, their potential role in drug tolerance and resistance in, in, in the context of patients? Uh, Corinna, that's a, a great suggestion. I hadn't really even thought about that yet. Uh, so I'll tuck that one back <laughs> in. Um, and the first question, I'm sorry, was just about, um, oh, any fitness yeah. advantages. Okay, so yeah, I would like to do a different experiment. So, so far, no. Um, the way we passaged the isolates was just single colony passage. There was no selection uh, or com competition during that. And so I think if I were to answer that question, um, I would want to design the experiment such that we actually compete strains uh, potentially with some sort of selective pressure, be it drug resistance uh, in low levels or uh, specifically thermal tolerance, something like that, um, where I can actually look at the fitness. Uh, but what I will say is that I am looking at phenotypes, phenotypic variation in the passage isolates. And I do, I'm, I'm looking at melanization so far, I'm looking at filamentation, and I am seeing a number of differences in the passage isolates. So phenotypic variation, I can definitely confirm, um, but whether or not there's a selective advantage, I'd like to do a separate set of experiments to look at that. Yeah, really interesting. I'd like just to follow up your, your observation as a difference between growth in liquid and growth on plates. Have you looked at the impact of density on, on those outcomes? So obviously, usually when we're doing um, liquid cultures, we start with one colony, right? And it becomes very dispersed and liquid, whereas on a plate, all the cells will be close together. And I just wonder if that, if that is part of the signaling uh, that you're, you're, you're seeing. That, that's interesting. Uh, and the way we did each passage is we would um, grow for two days till saturation and then take a single colony from that and then grow it up um, overnight culture. And so we passage it that way. Um, so yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. I'd have to think about that a little bit. 
It's also possible that because those isolates were in competition with each other, we may have seen an increase in the number of movements. Um, and so I don't, I don't know whether or not that's also the case. Yeah, great, really interesting work. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, uh, final questions for Benoit. And that is, um, Sarah Wong asks whether you've considered other PAMPs on, as on uh, Aspergillus fumigatus that could also be responsible for either activating or inhibiting the inflammasome. <clears throat> yeah, it has been shown for the um, RNA of Aspergillus, which is like able to activate the hint to inflammasome. And <clears throat> uh, before that, uh, before the gag, I, I, I show that it was not specific to uh, the one of Aspergillus, but I show that the um, beta glucan, beta 1 3 glucan, was able to activate also inflammasome. Um, <clears throat> But what I show it was if you transfect also, if you transfect directly into the cytosol, because um, <clears throat> it's complicated with um, uh, the polysaccharide like that. It's like, if you are looking only for priming, then activation. So this is different, but this one was like only, uh, it was looking for activation. So yeah, um, it, it seems that the, the polysaccharide can activate uh, inflammasome directly if you transfect, if you force to put inside the cytosol of the macrophage. And for the, the others, um, yeah, I'm interested to, to, to find some of those that uh, I don't have yet. All right, Liz, do you want the uh, final question? Yeah, sure. Or, yeah. And then, sorry, and then there's one more for Benoit. So pass you back for one more question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so Blake has snuck in the last moment here. Yep. Says, um, there's a paper from Jeff Boyk, I'm sorry, I'm terrible at names, where they showed that uh, retrotransposon accumulation lines in Cerevisiae were generally more sensitive to DNA damage. And he's wondering if you think your cryptococcus mutant, um, passive strains in these transposal element um, movements are more sensitive to DNA damaging agents. Um, that's interesting. I hadn't even thought about it. So thank you, Bill. I'll, I'll definitely think about that and get back to you. Yeah. All right, and final question for Benoit, and that is, um, if GAG is from Alexander Bruch, if GAG is influencing the translation of the host and forces the activation of the UPR, is it possible that it also activates other co-translational safeguard systems, such as NGD, NSD, or NMD? Um, <clears throat> yeah, possibly, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I, I, I didn't look at that, but uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah, because it's it's like also at the same time we 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 show the rock rate for 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 this. It's like also the stress granules, and uh, if it's, uh, it's a, this is also inducing stress granule, and we show before that stress granule it's like inhibiting uh, inflammasome for another paper, and we 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 was looking also for gag what happened for that, but uh, this mechanism was kind of different. But yeah, possibly there is there is a lot of other mechanism which we. Yeah, this can be interesting to, to look at. All right, I think that's all we have in the chat. So thank you to both speakers. Those were fantastic talks. Um, and for everyone else, um, please remember the Myco Talks uh, coming up at the end of May and the Medical Mycology Society of the Americas Symposium in June. Um, so I posted those in the chat earlier, but if you need the information, um, it's easy to find on Google or email someone. So, Thanks so much. Thank you very much. We'll see you all next Thank month. You. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, those were great talks. Thank you both. I really yeah. enjoyed them. Uh, Jessica and Liz, um, I think I made uh, screenshots of the questions and I did want to follow up. But is there is there a transcript of the chat comment or of the? Yes, chat? I will send the. I will send you the transcript of the chat. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, thank you both. How are you doing, Liz? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, it's very cold and rainy here. I don't know what it's like where you are, but it's hard to uh, it's hard to see that it's May here currently. So, well, we had snow two weeks ago. Oh no, really? And now it's almost eighty. So <laughs> okay, well at least it's warm now. But I, this is the thing: is like it, it frosted over here, it snowed in early April here and all the flowers immediately died, which had come out. So we're seeing a very, very slow spring uh, this year. Yeah, we usually get some snow in May, so hopefully that doesn't happen, but. 